Today's video is brought to you by MeUndies. Hey, brother. Okay, guys, for a very long time, one of the things I have always wondered about is basically everything to do with the Marauders map. Like, how on earth did the Marauders create this thing to begin with? Because it is like one of the most OP pieces of magic in the entire story. Also, are there any limits to its abilities? Would muggles show up on the map? And also, if the Marauders were this good at magic, how is it that the ever incompetent Filch is the one who confiscated it from them? Because for one, I don't think he ever could have got it from them. And for two, I don't think there's any chance he could have kept it from them. But with that confiscation comes the ever huge question about the Marauders map. Fred and George ultimately find it, but how do they ever figure out how to use it? I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Like, I know that they're up to no good, but are you telling me they guessed that passphrase? And not to knock Fred and George's magical abilities at all, because I actually think those abilities are immense, but it's a tough password to guess. And that's also if you are even able to realize that there is a password that needs to be guessed. So today we are going to roll up our sleeves and try to get to the bottom of all of it. Actually, I'm not wearing sleeves today, but you know what? Guys, before we dive on in, we need to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, MeUndies. What's awesome about MeUndies is that they care about comfort and not just what's touching your skin, but feeling comfortable in your own skin. That's why MeUndies uses not only sustainable, breathable, soft as heck fabric, but they give you a huge selection of designs to choose from so you can feel good inside and out. And I don't know about you guys, but me personally, I have like my favorite t-shirt, my favorite socks, and favorite underbridges, and today is a good day. It's like I'm sitting on a cloud. And their patterns are right up our alley. They've got Grogu, the Avengers, Harry Potter. I mean, so much awesome stuff to choose from. Plus, personally, I'm a huge fan of repping your favorite fandoms covert style. And you never have to leave your couch with a Me Undies membership, where they just send you new pairs to your door each month. Each time you get to choose a new pair of undies, socks, or a bralette, and the design that fits you best. It's super fun, right? And with your membership, you get free shipping, discounted rates, and early access to new launches. Definitely go check it out. And you can get 15% off your first order and free shipping when you go to MeUndies.com slash theories. I seriously cannot recommend it enough. Again, that is meundies.com slash theories for 15% off and free shipping. Link is in the description down below. The Marauders map, possibly one of the biggest plot devices in the entire series. If Harry was able to actually successfully use it. Let me clarify, he uses it constantly. He's just not good at it. This thing has the power to show and name every single person inside of the castle, including all of its secret passages, and Harry has an invisibility cloak and is constantly being caught by Filch. Filch! He can't even do magic! And also Snape, but let's face it, that guy's basically a bat. The point is, the thing is outrageously powerful and a Hogwarts artifact that I would argue is right up there with any of the Hogwarts founders' specific items. Or for that matter, I dare say, even the sorting hat. I mean, four wizards were literally able to put a piece of their intelligence into a piece of parchment. Everyone knows it's easier to put intelligence into hats than parchment. That's the real trick. Also, has it ever occurred to you or bothered you that Hogwarts is supposedly unplottable on a map and yet here exists a highly detailed map of Hogwarts? Or that the map is able to correctly label students generations later who were not born during the time of the invention of the map? Like, I'm not even saying it would be easy, but maybe you could have somehow put tracers on every student you were at school with at that point in time, but how is this thing future-proof? Also, in Chamber of Secrets, Harry gets blamed for dropping that pudding at the Dursley's household because the Ministry of Magic knows that magic happened there, but they're not able to identify who did it, so it has to be Harry. Meaning their trace technology is not even as good as what the Marauders map can do, because if it was, it would have shown that there was a house elf present during that time. Which, let me just say, this whole idea of not doing magic at home is bogus because anybody with wizarding parents is just able to do it because their parents can do magic. This is obviously the reason that Slytherin is constantly winning the house cup because their parents are ambitious and they're like, yo, we're using this advantage. They can't tell it's you. It's three free months of practice. Plus the whole blood purity thing means most of these students probably also have wizarding parents. Anyway, my point is that the Marauders 
four high schoolers are able to plot an unplottable location with better magic trace technology than a centuries old magical government whose primary job is tracking magical things. How do they do this? Like imagine if the Ministry of Magic had this technology for like all of London. Can't find fold. Wait, wait a second. No, he's right here. What's he doing out of florists? This wedding is going to be huge. Floral arches, chandeliers, wormtail. Have you called the caterers yet? Classic. Voldemort, terrible wedding planner, floral arches by this afternoon, you gotta be kidding me. But getting back on track, how did the Marauders do it? Well, first of all, let's tackle the unplottableness of Hogwarts because they actually tackle this in a really clever and easy way. The real idea about being unplottable is that you can't specifically show the location of Hogwarts on a map. So even though they map out the school itself, they don't give away where it is. It's kind of your classic. If you have a map, but have no idea where the place is that the map depicts, does that place even exist? It does. We actually made a video about Hogwarts exact location if you want to check that out. So very cleverly, the Marauders map doesn't actually tell you where the school is. And even though it does have reference points to places you can leave through all the secret passages, it doesn't tell you where those are. So again, you don't have any reference points to triangulate from. Triangulate. I said it wrong before. Honestly, the really impressive bit of magic they have going on here though is labeling every single person who is currently inside of the castle. Like how? Like again, I can kind of see a scenario where you were able to put a trace on all of the students who are currently at the school. But what I don't understand is how they have it continue to work into the future. Like. Where is it sourcing the names from? They're names that don't even exist yet. It seems like there would have to be some type of magically updated list that keeps track of everybody who comes to the school. And it seems that way because it literally is that way. Let me introduce you to the quill of acceptance in the book of admittance. These are two infallible magical artifacts from the four founders of Hogwarts themselves. They are both located in the castle in a tower that students never visit. The book is bound in dragon hide and the ink sits next to an ink well that is empty. And here's how it works. The moment that any child exhibits any form of magical ability at all, the quill will spring to life and try to write that person's name into the book. This boy's had his name known ever since you were born. But the failsafe here is that the book must agree with the quill. So if the book doesn't determine it as sufficient magic to actually produce magic, it won't let the quill write the person's name down. And these two combined have a perfect record. They have never made a mistake and admitted either a non-magical person or squib to the school. Which I need to weigh in here because I find that squib portion of that kind of ridiculous. Like they're still members of the magical community because the very definition of a squib is the non-magical offspring of magical parents. Meaning, they definitely know that magic exists. I am 100% on board for admitting these students to the school. You don't even need magic for a lot of the classes in the school. History of magic, care of magical creatures, herbology, ancient runes, arithmancy, astronomy, other classes that start with A. Yeah, they should be allowed. Who wants to start a group? The group for encouraging squib tolerance at the education place. What does that spell? Gestate? Puh. Tell you what, we're gonna hyphenate education place. Join Gestate today. We're making t-shirts. Maybe, we'll see. We have a lot to do. Anyway, the book and the quill. These two together document the existence of magical people by determining their magical prowess despite their age. Meaning there does exist something that the Marauders map could be sourcing all of these magical names from into the future forever. To me, this is both a good and maybe the only explanation as to how this map is able to perform this particular feat. And it also kind of helps explain how something that these high schoolers made is so ridiculously powered because it's quite literally sourcing some of its power from an artifact left by the original founders. But wait, would that mean that only students who attend Hogwarts would show up on the map? Would muggles show up on the map? Actually, even if you don't attend Hogwarts at all, you should still show up on the map because just because you didn't go to Hogwarts doesn't mean you couldn't have. For example, in Goblet of Fire, Draco talks about how he could have gone to Durmstrang and he could have. But either way, his name is still written into the book because he was also at the very least accepted to Hogwarts. And as for muggles, it does mean that they would not show up on the map at all, meaning that the map does have some limitations, but that's fairly inconsequential because muggles aren't allowed to go there and they can't even see the castle. But what about Filch? 
He is a squib who shows up on the map, but his name should not be in the book. Filch is indeed an odd case, and his existence at the school makes zero sense at all. But we here at Super Carlin Brothers believe that Filch is not only not a squib, but also not a human, rather a poltergeist. He shows up on the map because he is a literal part of the school in the same way that Peeves is able to show up on the map which he does. I know that that might sound like a little bit out of left field. We actually made an entire video about this particular topic. If you want to check it out, you can do so right here. I promise it makes sense. But for those of you who stuck around, in a nutshell, it goes like this. Peeves is a manifestation of rule breaking and Filch is a manifestation of rule following. They are both parts of the castle and therefore can exist on the map. And this continues to make sense when you consider the characters in the story that both of these two poltergeists most resonate with. Most of the teachers and Dumbledore really don't seem to take Filch seriously at all. They are supposed to be out of bed, you blithering idiot. But Umbridge does, and he loves Umbridge and effectively becomes an extension of her regime. Peeves, on the other hand, listens to nobody ever except Fred and George. Give her hell from us, Peeves! And Peeves, whom Harry had never seen to take an order from a student before, swept his belled hat from his head and sprang to a salute as Fred and George wheeled about to tumultuous applause from the students below and sped out the open front doors into the glorious sunset. We've finally made it full circle and we are back to Fred and George. To me, this is a particularly telling detail about Fred and George because all students have some mischief up their sleeves. It's how Peeves is able to exist at all. But Fred and George embody this idea in almost its purest form. Again, in the same way that Umbridge embodies rule following in its purest and ugliest of forms. Fred and George though are really two of a kind, save for perhaps the Marauders who preceded them by a couple of decades and who they are constantly compared to. Black and Potter, ringleaders of their little gang, both very bright, of course, exceptionally bright, in fact, but I don't think we've ever had such a pair of troublemakers. I don't know, Fred and George Weasley could give them a run for their money. Indeed they could, and I dare say exactly what the Marauders were hoping for, someone to carry on their legacy. Because again, I'm sorry, the people who created the Marauders map lost it to Filch? Not only does this seem unlikely based on what the map literally does in showing them where Filch is, but I also don't think that they would have struggled in getting it back from him at all, and yet it lives inside of Filch's office for years until the Weasley twins show up. What feels far more likely to me is that the Marauders were nearing their departure from the school and the map wasn't really gonna be much use to them anymore. But they would love to leave their path to success behind for a future band of tricksters to pick up on. And where better to hide it than the very place you may go if you were in trouble for breaking the rules, Filch's office. I mean, just look at the opening line of the map. Messrs. Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs, purveyor of aids to magical mischief makers, are proud to present the Marauder's Map. This title even kind of suggests that the map is intended for other mischief makers, not even just themselves. And when Lupin sees it years later, this is what he tells Harry. Because these map makers would have wanted to lure you out of the school, they'd think it was extremely entertaining. See, the point of the map is to get other students to use it, follow in their footsteps, carry on their legacy, and leave it somewhere that future mischief makers could find it, in Filch's office in a folder titled Confiscated and Highly Dangerous. I honestly doubt they had to do that much figuring at all to get the map to reveal itself to them. After all, the map would already be able to identify them based on its own magic. And we learn when Snape tries to read it that it kind of has some sentience of its own. Now, to be fair, the Marauder specifically did not like Snape, so this could be specifically a safeguard against just him. But I personally like to believe that the map also did not like Snape. The point is, I don't think Fred and George had to figure out the map. I think it quite literally presented itself to them. They are the Marauder's spiritual successors and telling them its secrets is literally what it's made to do. And finally, I think that Fred and George understood the sentiment of the creators of the map so much that they themselves passed it on to future mischief makers. Harry and the Golden Trio. But guys, for my question of the day, what do you think? Or are there any other little like problems or loopholes with the Marauders map? Let us know in the down section down below. Also, if you wanna join Jestate, they don't actually have a squib emoji, but they do have a squid emoji. So just leave that down below if you wanna be part of the group. It's fun, we have snacks that you can eat. 
and then gestate. Also guys, don't forget this week we are hosting fandom trivia here on the Super Carlin Brothers channel. It's going to start at 6 p.m. on Friday, May 21st. Be sure to set a reminder or something. We can't wait to see you there. Otherwise guys, as always, thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to like it if you hadn't already and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future Harry Potter action from us. If you'd like to see that full video about how Filch is definitely a poltergeist, you can do so by clicking it right over here. Otherwise, until next time, bye.